Dr. Power, oh. my guests have arrived. Oh, hi, Chelsea. Thanks. How are you doing today? Oh, very well, sir. Good, good. Okay, well, thank you. Hi, folks. Come on in. Rob's in town today. Hi, Rob. Good to see you visiting Victoria. We have the, the palm tree country down here. Uh, Johnny, Michael, good to see you again. Uh, Mike and Johnny, good posts this week. Um, Penelope, Rosemary, good to see you. Colleen, I like what you did on the railways this week, so have a seat. There's some space here. Let's get underway if we can. Um, this week we had uh, uh, we wrapped up the context case. This is Wednesday, and of course you see this the coming Monday, but we're doing up the Sleeman's case and wrapping it up. And it's just one of the context cases, like the Robin Hood case, where you can practice on your own, talk to your colleagues, practice some tools. At the end of the week I'll give you some thoughts that I have and sift them around and see how close you are on the target. And uh, I don't have them all. You may have better off thoughts than I have on it. Your head's as good as mine as we go through this stuff. But the idea is get you rehearsed, getting ready for the next big test coming up shortly is your individual paper. And there you're going to uh, take the case study. You already have it. It's in your textbook. Um, I, I think it's a beer one. I could be wrong. But it's, uh, you've got it in any event. I've got a number of courses I run. Um, but it's in your, in your uh, deliverable number three. Uh, do that case. Uh, you've got the questions. You wouldn't normally get the questions in a case analysis. But just to start it going, have a look at those. And again, you get your choice. You want to try it as a consultant. You can, takes a little longer, I'll take time to market, give you some feedback. But in the interest of time, where time's of the essence of much more to do, I'm happy if you just give me a cover page so I know who you are, and then you go right into question number one, answer it, question number two, answer it, etc. And uh, that's as good as it gets for your individual assignment. So we're practicing for that, and having done a couple of uh, context cases and having done your individual case study that I'll mark and give you extensive feedback on, takes a little time. Then on the exam, you will get a case that's also in your book. And I'll tell you what that case is on the commencement of week eight, on the Monday of week eight. So that gives you about a week and a half or so to look at that case, read it, talk to your colleagues. I don't mind that. Chat back and forth, see what tools uh, others are going to use, what tools you'll use, what are some of the issues. I will not be giving you the questions. That's for you to arrive at, but you've got a pretty good sense of the flow. There's nothing coming out of left field at you as to... Uh, in fact, often when you read case studies and case study analysis, and the Little Black Handbook shares with you how cases are written and what to look for, that you generally go fast at the front of a case, read the opening sentence of each paragraph, and slow down towards the back, because that's where the meat is, that's where the issues are. And it normally ends up with so-and-so sitting on a stump wondering what to do, and that pretty focuses you in where you have to do. And then getting that sense of overview, start reading again from the front, and come back at it again. You'll find that very helpful. Um, on the final exam, uh, as I say, half of that, while we're talking about exams, will be that case, 50% of your mark. So that's almost a give me. And on the front end, as I've said to you, there'll be six questions, do five. I've finished the exam, I've filed it in now. And uh, there are quotes from people like Drucker, there's Sun Tzu quotes, uh, there's little observations. But it's not so much about memorization, it's, it's stuff that I believe has been ingrained in you with deep learning through the, this course. So I sense most of you could pretty well answer those questions now. And time will be your enemy here. Time is of the essence. You've only got 90 minutes to do the first part and 90 minutes for the second part. And so you just analyze how many questions there are and how much time you have for each and do a little doodling and maybe on the left-hand side of the page or something and then get at it. So uh, that's your final exam. This week I posted a very important YouTube video for you. I wanted you to look at the uh, Blue Ocean Strategy. We covered as one of the uh, strategies you can consider doing uh, in, the, in the sections of the materials, and uh, the materials are good, and uh, you recall in the first, the, f the first second session, Little Red Toolbox, we had a value proposition, um, value proposition for the industry. It was uh, Hudson Bay and Mom and Pop Shop, and uh, um, I think it was Eaton's or something in there. But along the bottom axis, uh, it stated, here are the key success factors, here are the attributes to be successful in that industry, and they were listed. And up this axis, on this side here, you can put percentages, 10%, 20%, 90%, 100%, or simply low, medium, and high. And then you simply fill in that if you want to be low cost, then of course the, uh, the ambience is not important. But that's a, key, that's a key success factor when you start in the retail business to determine are you going to be, uh, is your business model one, of your, is your strategy going to be one of differentiation, or is it going to be a low cost strategy? And if it's a low cost strategy, then ambience to you is a very low interest. It's, 1%, 2%, 10%, uh, close to nothing, but uh, on the other side, another key success factor is cost, and low cost is critical to you, so that's a very high factor. And so we did that tool in the opening session, and this it's interesting, this blue ocean strategy, they call it a value, uh, value industry curve, so they're much the same as a value proposition curve. Have a look at it, but I do encourage you to take one more time, go through that, and understand it. It's a valuable tool for you, and I'm also going to suggest if you get time for you and your colleagues at work, not your team members, but at work, 
it's worth looking at that collectively and sitting for a few minutes reflecting in the light of the internet of everything and this new industrial age and all the new things that are coming at us I'm confident that if you looked at that for a few minutes and reflected and had a conversation about it uh, you could come up with uh, some new blue ocean for your industry that is emerging through the fog right now because of technology and innovation that others haven't moved at yet and so I'd encourage you to perform that exercise see that video um, on the curve in fact it comes out with a four action framework it looks much like uh, Porter's Five Forces, a little square, but it's basically new, mid model, new mental models of, of how we look at things, simply saying eliminate. What can we eliminate um, that the industry sort of takes for granted? Uh, what can we reduce uh, that are well below the standard? What can we raise uh, that uh, the industry uh, has the bar too low? What can we bring up? Um, what can we uh, do with respect to creating new, uh, new factors, things that have never been offered before within the organizations? And today, with, with sensors and every car you buy, there's a new little Gidget in there that uh, we hadn't thought about before, but based on sensors, you can open the tailgate by putting your foot under it. Uh, I can now in my car sit there, and I've got a helicopter view of my whole car, backing up and backing out. Uh, I've got a large, giant telescreen screen in the car, as opposed to a little, small, little thing, which makes it good for backing up. And it's 180 degrees, so backing out, I can see completely down 90 degrees and 90 degrees. The car is coming this way without cranking my neck. So there's all sorts of stuff that can be, be taking place. We can look at. And they'll all lead to a new value proposition curve for your industry. So have a look at it. Uh, this week, as we move ahead, uh, we're going into modes of entry. Uh, and with modes of entry, there's increasing risk as we decide to put more and more foreign direct investment and get involved more offshore. The easiest one is simply an export situation that uh, you want to buy a case of beer, send me the money, I'll send you the case of beer. Race straight up to green fields where I go in and invest lots of money. I own it outright myself. I have a green field to work with. I plow and build and put cement in and build the factory just the way I want it, as opposed to buying existing. And there's a range of options in there, modes of entry. And that's something you consider in your strategy when you do market entry strategy. Um, have a look at those, the advantages, disadvantages of them. And I think I post, I'm pretty sure I have posted a slide in there that gives you all the advantages and disadvantages of each that you can have a look at. Um, it also talks a bit about P3s. Don't spend a lot of time on P3s. Many of you are aware of P3s. Uh, they've been around now. I've been consulting in that area now. Well, I'm going to say damn close to 30 years. We've been public-private partnerships. Uh, so they're a long way down the road. Um, interesting enough, in the, in the States, uh, sometimes they're not a panacea for everything. And in the States, their prisons down there, in large part, are, are P3s, are public-private partnerships, where somebody like you and I can own the prison and we get a guarantee from the state that they'll fill so many bed spaces. Well, that leads, of course, to what we see in the states, doesn't it? We see this high incarceration rate where there's so many black folks and others that are arrested and put in just because they have to fill bed spaces. If you've got money um, or uh, a Democrat at a high level, um, don't have to worry so much about the bed spaces. But uh, have a look at down there. In fact, talk about prisons maybe this week. Is it, is it an industry? It's an industry here in Canada, too. If, I think we incarcerate too many people in Canada for... Um, for marijuana and other things, that if you uh, looked at that industry from the prisons to the judges to the social workers to the parole officers to the welfare systems to the lawyers um, to the buildings, it just goes on and on the list of folks involved in this. It's a big industry. And uh, can we cut that back? Can we prune it back a little bit? Can we put the money elsewhere? Can we come up with new mental models on how to? Uh, um, sort of rehabilitate uh, folks who have crossed the line. Um, so let's get at what's in the news today, if I can. Uh, I've got a couple of interesting magazines I want to refer you to. The first one is Foreign Affairs. I think I've talked about it already. It's reasonably budget price. It's a great thing. And what I like about it for old farts is the print size is about 16 font. I didn't realize why I was reading it for cover to cover, but it was because unlike the Time magazine and Economist that have fine print, um, this is very large print, very easy to read, lots of white space, which makes it a treat. And the articles are short, seven, ten pages, but they're up to date and a good political overview of what's going on around the world. And this, uh, as Brzezinski calls it, the grand chessboard on different states and things that they, as they move around. The other thing I'd encourage you to do is there's something called the Canadian International Council. I'm a member of that, the Canadian International Council. And they have branches across the country, but they bring interesting speakers in on, on international global issues, strategic issues, things that are likely to impact strategy. So if you're interested and have the time, seek them out in your area. They're worth going down and meeting some people who have like minds and like thoughts as you have and, uh, and joined into those, ses joined those sessions. Um, well, we have in the United States, U.S., Britain warned of Russian cyber attacks. Uh, 
um, as Russia tries to come back and so we're going into a hacking warfare and I think somewhere early on in this course we showed you actually live hacking. There's a link you can have a look at that's taking place. In Mexico we have a situation where the mayor uh, from a city in the western uh, townships there was gunned down over the weekend. Another 30 candidates mostly at the local level have been killed getting ready for the July 1st elections coming up which is not far away. Um, and as many as 80 folks have been killed uh, over for the election coming up in September. So there's lots of concerns about how about the electoral process and how legitimate it is. They sent in observers to have a look at it and uh, we should know uh, what the outcome happens to be, but they're getting concerned uh, whether it be a valid election or not south of the border. Uh, Hungary, we've got Viktor Orban's victory, uh, right wing, uh, much in the Trump mode, strong over there, anti-immigrants, um, doesn't want any more into the system at this point, trying to uh, bring Budapest and that down, but there's uh, tens of thousands of people taken to the streets or never Trump, never Orban is, is taking place. And he says he's not stepping down. International observers watched the election and ruled it was deemed free. And, uh, but there's lots of dissatisfaction going on right now by those that don't want him in office. We could have a look at that. Um, airstrike in Syria, we've talked a bit about that going back and forth. Um, got some details here on it, but it's pretty well been well covered in the news right now, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, other than maybe we should talk for a few minutes just about, about that region. There's some things we can do so what's and think about. But on one side, of course, you have Syria sitting here on Israel down below sharing a border. You've got uh, uh, Lebanon over here sharing a border. You've got the Mediterranean Sea over here. Um, you have up over here the Kurds uh, want a piece of it for their home, which they're trying to establish. Um, you've got oils going both from uh, uh, Russian back oil and, uh, and uh, the American back oil pipelines coming through Syria, trying to get to Europe uh, to uh, uh, see who's going to supply the region with, uh, with energy. Um, and uh, you've got this, this cluster of folks coming around Syria, Russia, Iran, Hamas, is in, China is in it, all supports to some degree or another that particular position of supporting Syria. Russia doesn't want to leave Syria, uh, not just for the oil, but for the, what they've got invested there. It's a way to the Mediterranean. They've got a large port in the Mediterranean. It's a place for air bases. And it's exercising, it's resurrecting the, uh, the Russian um, bear in the sense of the old Soviet Union model which has long been a dream of uh, Putin to uh, try to re revitalize the, the, old, uh, the old Russia, the old Soviet Union, uh, looking at it. On the other side of the coin, of course, you have the, uh, uh, the Brits and the American, and uh, almost a bird of NATO, because uh, there's a clause in there, there's tack on one, there's tack on all. And so you've got almost a lot of the NATO national and uh, Canada's lended support saying, uh, no troops, but certainly we support you. Uh, we've done that. And so uh, the other side of the house is, is building as well as this thing this thing unfolds. And so it's all about Shia and Sunnah to some extent. I mean, Israel's here and right on the border. Israel's very concerned that uh, Iran has been long threatening to destroy Israel completely and now it's able to move its troops and it has moved its troops right over here next to the border uh, in, in uh, Syria as part of the uh, helping to bring it down and quell and keep the current regime in power. And uh, Israel won't stand for that. And so uh, um, even if Trump and the rest of the nations don't do anything, I think Israel will continue to uh, go in and knock and play havoc in, in the area. So uh, it's going to be a very hotly contested uh, little piece of piece of land with all the stakeholders moving around as we look at it. There's much in there we could talk about, uh, but again, you have this vying because I think the Saudis and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Sunnis are, uh, with Saudi leadership increasingly are going to start playing a role in Syria to exercise their their strengths, and it's this conflict between Saudi and Iran as to Shia, Sunni, who's going to actually be running the uh, that area of the region, who's going to be the regional power, and uh, Saudi is uh, reshaping, reforming, and re redoing alliances to uh, play a greater role. So there's lots of things happening there we need to watch for, because any one of those, you recall we talked about those choke points of the Gulf of Hormuz and Al Baba coming down uh, the Red Sea, both two choke points here, and they uh, they can play great havoc with the price of oil. In fact, it's already playing with the price of oil, just the threat is driving oil prices up. Uh, the uh, the uh, um, oil off uh, North Sea oil is now about $76 a barrel, uh, which is a little higher than the Western Texas route. And of course, in Canada, we even get less rate than that. But the point is the price is coming up. And that's good for petrol countries, bad for us as uh, folks trying to fill our gas tank. In Mali, they've got militants disguised as uh, Peacekeepers, uh, attack bases uh, down below. Um, not going to spend a lot of time on that. 
Um, the United States Navy. Yeah, there's a couple of stories here I picked up in the U.S. Navy, which is telling of the times the American Navy are trying to push up from 300 to 355 ships, trying to revitalize their Navy, put it in, Trump spending money on it. And you can ask why. It's pretty self-evident that uh, Trump is doing everything he can to uh, get his team ready in case they're needed. As, so the United States Navy is uh, the first is looking at its hospital ships. It's going to retire uh, one or both of its current Mercy class hospital ships. These are 70,000 tons and have more facilities than the Nimitz and, uh, and the, uh, uh, the Gerald Ford uh, aircraft carriers. They've got better class three uh, medical services on board. But in lieu of that, they want to build a bunch of small little ships, expeditionary, uh, expeditionary fast transport called the Spearhead class. And these are small little runabouts that will actually be carried on some of the other ships to the, uh, to the area they're supposed to be in and uh, be deployed that way. But uh, certainly they're doing that, but they still may keep these two ships in as well. These ships are good, by the way, if you have a national emergency, the, uh, the ability to generate electricity, they can go into places like Haiti and just tie up, and there's enough power, generation power in, in those ships to uh, light cities. And so uh, I wouldn't be too fast to get rid of them, but they're doing that. But uh, they're also, I think my, at this point too, is they also have the early Burke class. Uh, they've now extended their operations out to 45 years, which um, makes it large. They've got 65 of these things, and they are now uh, extending their life of them, refurbishing them, and putting them, keeping them in the system. And that's going to help them reach their 355 ship goal by, I think it's 2030 rather than 2050. And so uh, they're jumping up and getting ready to do things um, and get their uh, forces in place. And it's so they can have more than a two. The whole American system has been built on a, uh, a two-front war system, but uh, they now seem to be structuring themselves to possibly do more than two-front. And uh, every time you have a war or something like that, if you're doing something in Syria, you need uh, one-third of the troops on the ground that are there today doing what they do. They come back and rest for a period of time, and the other third are being trained. And so you've got at least whatever you see on the ground, you can multiply so it becomes a one-third, one-third, one-third. Uh, that's a large large equipment. Um, recent Turkey are at it again. They've been at it for a long time, tensions. But it's all about oil and gas found off in the Aegean Sea and off Cyprus that uh, they're getting ready to do battle over. Um, much like Canada's North, it's it's interesting. In fact, Rob sent me his paper that he did. I don't think Rob would mind me sharing. It's a great paper. Um, all about Canada's North and some of the concerns and their number of issues. And Canada's what it's doing uh, up North, what it could do up North. But it's interesting to see the encroachment and the, and the soft, gentle hand of, of China taking a bigger role in Canada's north. Uh, research stations, um, and research stations are just the, the footprint starting with a, a Chinese flag flying over it in Canada's north. Um, but from that, then the services, ships come in for servicing the research stations, and the ships get bigger and bigger, and then finally there's some sort of security around the research station. And next thing you know, we have troops sitting in Canada's north. And uh, I don't think our political leaders have uh, have done enough. I mentioned to Rob that it should have been shared. If you go to China and do some things like this, uh, they say, of course, come in, but it'll be a joint operation where Canadians will play a role, and the Canadian flag will fly above it. Uh, so, uh, anyway, it's a good paper. I enjoyed the read on it. Uh, Japan's Coast Guard. Yeah, that's, yeah, Japan's Coast Guard doing the same thing. Because of all these uh, East China Sea and South China Sea, China taking these little coral reefs and building up what become like floating aircraft carriers with missiles and um, protected harbors, etc., etc. Japan has now started putting four of those in place up on the East China Sea, um, saying it's better to uh, respond to illegal North Korean fishing, but nevertheless it's the same idea. They're exercising ownership, uh, which is going to bring that area into more tension that we can look at. So that's some of the things I've picked up in the, in the general paper. Um, I want to go to this paper now very quickly if I can. Um, we have WestJet uh, swoop off the ground, SWOOP swoop. It's a new budget priced airline for WestJet uh, in response to Norwegian and other budget priced carriers coming into Canada. And you recall, I think we've covered this week, the, some of the defensive postures, and this, this article illustrates it perfectly. We talked in terms of the, uh, the mouse that roared. It was a movie by Peter Yusinov. Um, basically some little country of uh, Estonia or something like that, it wasn't, but some little country like that in Europe. And uh, they had the idea to resolve their budget issue, they'd declare war on the states. Uh, the minute the Americans accepted the gauntlet war, they'd declare peace and we quit, we surrender, and ask for reparations to bring money in. But here you have like Kim Jong-un, the most that roared. Um, WestJet is 
barking right now. We're going to get our swoop going and we're going to be ready to defend and uh, occupy so don't bother coming to Canada because uh, we're already there. So it's moving quickly to get its low cost uh, competitors up to meet the new rivals head on. Uh, it's also a toe-to-toe -to -toe strategy for defense. When uh, If you find that uh, you've got the resources, the assets to do this, one of the strategies for that then is go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Um, uh, Corel Draw tried that against Microsoft back in the good old days and uh, um, in fact I remember uh, uh, Michael Copeland was the fellow's name who was the CEO as I recall of, uh, of uh, Microsoft reportedly in the newspapers went up to Bill Gates and said I'm coming after you and uh, uh, six months later Bill Gates owned Corel Draw, 25% of it and uh, that company was on the downhill side. So uh, you don't go toe-to-toe -to -toe unless you've got the resources to back it up. And also what happens when you poke the bear, when Norwegian comes in saying we're coming to your territory, uh, WestJet says fine, we're now going into Nor Nor uh, Norwegian territory with some WestJet group who expanded our lines to go over there. So it's a good example this week of what we've been covering. Uh, Canadian dairy market uh, is of interest, uh, key target in NAFTA. Uh, they're asking that it, uh, it be re-looked at in NAFTA before this thing runs, time runs out. And they've got two changes they want. In the long term, they want to eliminate Canada's supply management system, like the wage, like uh, egg uh, marketing boards and things like that. They want to get some control over that and open it up for competition. And then they want a special rule to allow uh, byproducts, cheese making, skimmed off milk, sold at market prices. I think most of us who go to the States find the American cheeses far more budget price than Canadian cheeses and milks, etc. And in fact, uh, when I used to live in the mainland, many people went down into uh, so awesome in that area and uh, could just nip across the border and do a lot of shopping down there and come back. And so they want to get the, the playing field leveled that uh, they say we're uh, uh, selling below market prices. Um, may or may not be, but it's a case we can look at this week. How valid is it? Starbucks is going to train its workers for unconscious bias. There were two black uh, men who were arrested when employees said they were trespassing on the property. And it turned out they weren't They're entitled to be there. But uh, Starbucks uh, has moved quickly, and any time you've got a problem like that, it's, it's better to jump right in. So these are going to close all the Starbucks for two days. Anybody's going to go undergo sensitivity and cross-cultural training, and uh, to get rid of this altogether, that uh, sometimes, like fish, we're swimming in the water, we don't recognize what the other side of the hand's all about till you get out of the hand. And so uh, a good shake-up sometimes like that is necessary just to, you wouldn't think so, but I think it's necessary just to uh, let people have a good hard look at what's going on. Um, we have this fight going on between uh, um, BC and, uh, and uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan and the federal government uh, all over the, uh, this pipeline going through into, uh, into BC and environmentalists, etc. We're saying thanks, but no thanks. Uh, Notley in, in uh, Alberta is uh, landlocked, has to get the goods and services out. It represents big money to Canada in revenues, big money to Alberta in revenues, and money to uh, to BC, and I think part of the problem is the cut for BC is too low, and uh, although they don't declare it much, I think if you increase the price that BC got, uh, ostensibly to help with any spills off the coast, um, possibly might be a little more to go ahead. But Saskatchewan's jumped in too, because their concern is is that if Notley goes ahead with her, her promise to uh, cut energy to BC by so many barrels of, uh, of oil, the price of fuel in, Canada, in, in BC may go up as much as 10 cents a litre. And uh, because there'll be less coming in, um, because we have to ship it now by uh, by oil tankers, and if we ship it by oil tankers to run the pipeline, that means Saskatchewan can't get its materials kind of backed up, because um, it also, although not the same numbers, but it nevertheless uh, ships oil. And so they're concerned too, so they've threatened to cut off fuel to uh, BC as well to some extent. So we can look at that a little bit. It's interesting that uh, Quebec jumped in and supported. BC. Uh, we we're with Hogan saying, uh, no, we support. Uh, you have the right to uh, to stop. And of course, we had the Eastern Pipeline about a year or so ago trying to go through Quebec, and they stood up and said, no, you can't have it. So the Maritimes uh, weren't getting uh, the ability to bring oil in or put oil out because they couldn't cross uh, the province of Quebec. Basic income tax uh, out the uh, big article today in there, and that just leads me to believe that. Uh, it still may work. Uh, it says basic income for Canadians would cost $76 billion a year. And uh, then they go on and talk about the shortfall is about 40 some odd billion dollars a year. Keep in mind the deficit this year is 28 billion. So it's a little bit bigger than the deficit for the year. And we could have guaranteed annual income for folks in Canada at a reduced level. Uh, they haven't put it for everybody yet. But uh, 
What's missing from the story, of course, basic annual income uh, system only works if we collapse all the support systems. And they haven't done that. In fact, they want to add extra supports to put it into place to make it happen. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to work. You, you cut down all the government services, and that's where you get the missing $43 billion from uh, to say that it just might work. And so uh, we could just have a look at that if you're interested in it. Uh, G7 should name and shame oceans over fishers, according to the minister in, in Ottawa. That uh, the salmon out there, they have, uh, they take more than 400 kilograms, 400,000 kilograms of wild salmon out of the Pacific Ocean uh, in one net that's eight kilometers long, and they pull that amount of salmon out in one swoop. Uh, we have it on the other coast where they use trawlers and draggers, and they scrape the bottom so all the beds get ripped up and torn, and all fish are caught, and what they don't want, they throw back in and dead. And it's really killing the uh, great fishing grounds off Newfoundland and George's Bank and those places off Nova Scotia are being impacted by the same tragedy of the commons, that idea that we are well, well, well familiar with, that uh, when something's free, people overuse it and uh, kill it. And so uh, we may talk a little bit about overfishing our oceans and uh, should we name the people that are doing behind this. Um, Rogers is testing new 5G technology in the Ottawa area, Toronto area. Uh, all part of Porter's Five Forces Advanced Factor Endowments. Good, we're putting it in. And it's interesting, they said they need it for autonomous cars because it improves the sensor capability of people in the dark in black wearing black suits. Cars still haven't quite picked up as, as well as they might. And the 5G, along with some new uh, chips coming out, are going to improve that sensor capability. So uh, interesting, the 5G being tested in Ottawa, not right away, but it's going into the system. Um, Bank of America's profit surge on uh, higher interest rates. Banks are doing well in the States, both um, on loan growth. But the problem with that is, is that um, I was reading some reports for people that are in the, in the discretionary side, the boats and the trailers and those sort of things, mobile homes, um, as interest rates go up from the 4%, 5% to the 6 7 8% range, uh, their sales are starting to collapse as we go through it, because they, um, it's getting to that tipping point that it's just not worth uh, worth buying where if it's discretionary. And so uh, people in those sort of markets are concerned that the bank rate's going up. In fact, I, I'd read a while back an interesting thing by, uh, oh, his name will come to me, he's on uh, the news occasionally, Mark Stein. Mark Stein has written a book. And in the book, I read about interest rates in, in America, and this was now about three or four years ago, where the interest rates had a historic low that had gone up now about four or five uh, uh, quarter of a point, so it'll be about a point and a half of a basis point since the article was written. But at that time, what, what struck me was, he said the interest rate on America's debt, primarily over to China, is $285 billion a year, $285 billion a year. And that's just about equal to what the People's Liberation Army budget is for the year. And he said, if interest rates in the states go back up to historic norms of five, five, four to five percent, um, and that's where they're heading, they've, they've started that move, they're halfway there now, um, he said the interest rate payments to China will be $845 billion, $845 billion. He said that's enough for the People's Liberation Army to be increased fourfold, paid for entirely by the U.S. taxpayer. So this idea of interest rates moving and going up, um, we should be watching at this point because it uh, could easily put the damper on um, our growth and GMP in, in Canada and the States. Um, in fact, the article right below, it says rising interest rates are starting to pinch more Canadians. 47% said they do not believe they'll be able to cover their living and family expenses over the next 12 months without going further into debt. Um, the poll was a consumer debt index survey. Um, they said 51% of respondents fear rising rates could impact their ability. Yeah, so uh, increasingly people are becoming aware of the debt in Canada, and many find themselves caught off guard. And uh, there's no excuse for that because we've had the Bank of Canada and bankers and everybody else um, ringing the alarm bells for the last year and a half saying uh, get back on side because this could happen. The uh, European Central Bank, the equivalent of the Feds in the States and our Canada, uh, Bank of Canada have advised the Deutsche Bank, which is the bank of Germany, in fact it's, when you talk of Germany and financial systems, it's the Deutsche Bank, that maybe they should offload and get rid of their investment banking arm because um, it's been losing money and the Deutsche Bank failed some stress tests um, about a year, year and a half ago now um, they're doing a little better coming back up, but nevertheless it's concerned when the bank banking system may or may not be having trouble. So watch the Deutsche Bank, watch the stress tests for the European banks. But having said that, the European Union uh, currency is coming back up. The EU is looking much better, I'll talk about it in a moment. 
In Ontario, the NDP vow to tax to add uh, child care and health care, and uh, it's a uh, new Democrat uh, June election coming up, and I'm trying to think of the lady's name, oh, Andrea Horwath. Uh, she's suggesting no problem, we're just going to spend more money on daycare and health care, and of course all that's good. But it was Margaret Thatcher who said words to the effect that uh, the only problem with uh, socialism is that uh, eventually you run out of other people's money. And I think that's what's happening here. Debt fatigue, uh, the, uh, our uh, Tax Freedom Day in Canada is uh, 9 June. Every penny you make from the 1st of January to the 9th of June goes to one level of government in the form of taxes. Uh, you, and uh, that, those are your goods. Your time's your goods. That's all you get to sell is your time. And so you are uh, standing to deliver and, and uh, they take it. Um, in Cuba, strange things going on. There's uh, brain symptoms going on down there. You call the Americans over a year or so ago had the same problem with their embassy, and now Canadians are having the same sort of problem. And so they're bringing a lot of Canadians home until they figure out what it. They can't. They can't figure out what it is yet. They they just know that uh, people coming back with uh, um, brain problems and uh, don't know quite what what's causing it. Yeah, Brexit is still there, and it raises Brexit. Uh, part of that is, is interesting to talk in terms of uh, um, the Crown. Uh, one of the questions I'll put to you this week is uh, the Commonwealth. There's 50, uh, um, there's 2.4 billion people in the Commonwealth. There's $10 trillion in total is the economic output of the Commonwealth. There's 53 Commonwealth nations. People like Australia, New Zealand, Canada uh, are all part of that. and. Uh, 13 of those countries still have the Queen as our, as our Queen of Canada. And uh, the question becomes, do we need a Queen of Canada? Or should we simply get rid of the monarchy altogether and lieutenant governors and governor generals and uh, simply have uh, President Trudeau? And I think many of us would argue that uh, that's what makes us Canada in large part is that we do have a Queen as opposed to a presidential system. And uh, in BC, uh, the last election, the NDP got in, even though they had less votes and less seats. But they were able to put a coalition together with the Green Party, and it was a choice for the lieutenant governor at that point to say, no, liberals, you rule, or NDP, you rule. And uh, they fired out the existing government liberals and put the NDP in, and that's uh, where Horgan comes from at this point. So we could look at that as interesting. Um, another part of that is the, uh, the Queen, it was Turks and Caicos. Um, it's a territory-owned deep sea port, the only deep sea port down in the Caribbean, and uh, under British rule. but. Several times I've asked to join Canada as one of our provinces or a territory, and it's a very small number of people, 35,000 people, I think, only in total in the Caribbean and Caicos. And what a marvelous thing for us. But we keep rejecting and saying thanks, but no thanks. And uh, I, for one, like to see that revisited to have a piece of Canada down uh, in the Caribbean. Um, and then they also say the leadership of the Commonwealth is up for grabs that the Queen may not make the, the annual conference for the Commonwealth Nations, and she was appointed in 1953, and it, it's not hereditary, you get that appointment, she was appointed for Britain to run the Commonwealth in 1953, but now the saying comes up for grabs, and they're not sure that uh, Prince Charles and, uh, and Camilla are the right fit to, be the, uh, to take over, and they say it should be a free election. So it may well be the head of the Commonwealth may be some other nation uh, as this unfolds this summer, so watch for that. Um, Ethics Committee to Broaden Privacy Study. Oh, that's still happening. Yeah, in Canada, we see it in the States, but now we have the members of Parliament, not just Facebook, but they want to start looking at Google as well and look in terms of the mass amount of data on individuals and stored and, and the blurring of the vital link between business and customers. And uh, they want to talk in terms of uh, setting up. They go through a bunch of stories here, what's happening. But they want to talk about regulations for those industries coming in. And I, I think, as we said, they, they either have a choice of voluntary doing to themselves, like lawyers and doctors and other folks do. You put your own association together, put in your own rules and regulations, and keep the temperature down for the politicians. But if you fail to do that, then the politicians have to step in and do it. So often you're better to perform the operation on yourself than the draconian measures that, uh, that the government may take. And so I think they're at that point that's now. They better move quickly, or uh, government's going to do it for them. In Quebec, there's still this foot with a hijab going on. Uh, and we passed back uh, oh, decades ago, the RCMP could wear hijabs um, and priests could wear collars turned around. It was part of the uh, culture and religious heritage. Um, but for some reason in Quebec, they're fighting it again. Some young school girl has been uh, given a hard time because she's wearing the hijab. And so uh, that's interesting. 
Um, they did a comparison here to Macron in France and Trudeau in Canada. Uh, Trudeau's over there speaking to the French uh, uh, Legislative Assembly. And uh, they make the point that Trudeau has been busy in many ways. Uh, he's been steering the company to the country to the left. He uh, tax hiked on the rich. He's uh, influx of refugees, bill to legalize pots, um, and uh, national standards, and uh, moving ahead on carbon tax prices. Um, on the French side of the house, uh, similar young man uh, over there running it, fixing structural problems that he cut the wealth tax on the rich. Uh, to spur investments, push through labor code reforms um, on the powerful unions, and he's uh, trying to break up the monopolies on the trains and on the uh, educational system. So uh, it's interesting to compare the two, and uh, we don't look quite as good as the new emerging French leader does. And that's interesting too that when they when they put that together, if we had the uh, um, France was able to punch above its weight because Germany was still coming out of that that period of, of humiliation after losing the war and the sense of culture, didn't want to be flamboyant, didn't want to be seen as being the power in Europe. So France was allowed to take the leadership role in the, in the formation of the European Union. And then in recent days under Merkel, Merkel seems to be the head person and very much in charge of the, of the, of the cluster. And then of recent date, uh, Macron seems to be emerging, coming back up again, and Merkel seems to be sliding sideways. So it's interesting what the pendulum of power swing between the two. Um, a couple of little things I had up. We well, won't read the foreign affairs, but I did have two in the uh, in the business week this week that I thought were worth little points, and the foreign affairs one I'll save for another day. There's always good articles in there. This was a robot detecting lung cancer, um, powered by machines, and by putting in the uh, proper programming, etc. They can perform not just simple procedures, but moving ahead to some very sophisticated ones, and the FDA and the states have approved it. And they're saying that it's not a matter of uh, five to ten years. He says, no, it's going to be 18 months before these things are available. So that's moving along quickly. And that's another innovation, another cost, and uh, time after time the operations will be close to perfect, as opposed to depending on the idiosyncratic factor of the individual doctor that particular day. And here's what the euro is uh, coming back up, and it's uh, starting to look better. It hasn't looked for a decade, but it's coming back up. And uh, what was interesting to me was the distribution of uh, foreign reserves. And so they've got 6.1 trillion in US dollars, uh, 1.9 trillion in euros, uh, 0.4 trillion in Japanese yen, 0.4 trillion in British pounds, and 0.7 trillion in the other, which would include the Chinese currency, which has now been admitted into the basket of goods of the IMF and rising quickly. And so uh, the good news is the euro is coming back up as a competitor to the American dollar, and uh, competition is good for all. Well, folks, I think that completes today. We've covered a lot of materials, lots in there to talk about, but add anything you'd like to talk about. I do hope you're enjoying it. We're coming to the end of our, our march together. I'm going to look forward to seeing you all in EL2. Take care now. Bye-bye.